been a crazy day. I'm a little jet lagged from the time change and Joel has filled my day. So I've met amazingly wonderful people and it's such a like authentic and you know really friendly environment and I got a sense that everybody I was meeting was either on their way from a student or to a student which I think is a really good sign about <laughs> what's going on in a university. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, and uh, I, I do come as somebody who I think from the progressive social change world has experiences that are a little different than the average program person at a, at a general philanthropy. Some of you have been on boards or run foundations and um, number one, there's the whole world of Hollywood, which is, it might as well be another planet, you know, it's like, I'll talk about that in a little while, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. I mean, it is so not the traditional world of East Coast, intellectual, many years of families, too much is given, much is expected. It's like the Wild West, all new money, self-made, people who want what they want it now. You know, it's just a very different experience for me. And after 25 years there, I, I just really have learned a lot, of the, a lot of the lessons of the differences between the East and West Coast. Uh, the other thing I, I bring is an, an experience having worked in various worlds of social change as opposed to just being a practitioner of philanthropy. Um, I am a person who really learns by doing and I've had some of the best teachers uh, who yelled at me, screamed at me, held me when I was down, picked me up and, and, and I probably have to say that some of the people are, I, mean, I met Joel Fleischman when he was 40 years old so let me just say he's watched me grow up <laughs> um, and I think I was 24, 25 then and uh, some of those people were Joel's friends who played that incredible mentorship role in my life and really encouraged me to try to go for what I wanted and believed in as opposed to fitting some kind of a cookie cutter job. And so I'd say that I sit before you as somebody who's sort of done it my own way and uh, went for what I wanted and figured out a way to be paid to be me, which is a great way to spend your life, being you, authentically you. Um, and as a result, whether I started my post-college time as a fellow with Saul Alinsky, where not like our president, where he was affiliated with the Alinsky Institute, Saul was my teacher. And that was the most rigorous experience of Marine boot camp intellectually that any human being could ever go through because by every, you'd go out on a field assignment one day, you'd come back and by the next morning you had talked into a telephone, everything was recorded and for 40 minutes he pulled apart everything you said, why you did it, how you did it, what were you going to do tomorrow, what were going to be the reactions if you did that, what would be the reactions to that. And it was like, all of a sudden, it was like you're learning chess in a large political sphere in terms of who has power, who doesn't, and how to think outside the box in terms of getting power. So I meet a lot of colleagues who come from very traditional backgrounds. They were often have come through a university situation or a nonprofit, and they then go to work in philanthropy. I, um, I did come out of the other side of the table, but I think I didn't come from the typical nonprofit world. I've been a labor organizer. I worked with the mine workers after Jackie Blonsky was murdered uh, in West Virginia um, many, many years ago in 1972. So I really understood labor in those years. I've been arrested many times in various demonstrations, sometimes with very prominent people at the South African Embassy, other times in El Paso, Texas with not so prominent people when I was in a fair, fair housing march and many times during the Vietnam War. Um, it's amazing that President Carter hired me actually with my arrest record but at the time Ann Wexler who was at the time the head of the Democratic National Committee said we want all parts of the Democratic Party in this administration we're not giving you defense or treasury or state. You, 
<laughs> you can have, you can be Earth Mother to 5,000 young people who think they want to change the world and make American communities of people with very little power learn to have more power. And um, it was honestly, at the time, me, I'm 28 years old, I didn't know, my first memo was from Stu Eisenstadt, and it was, it was from DPS to V. I didn't even know what he was talking, what it was. I didn't know, even know what DPS was. It was like all initials, I had no idea. It was about ZBB. And it was like from the domestic policy staff to VISTA regarding zero-based budgeting. And so at 28 years old, I'm told I have to figure out $69 million out-year spending in a federal program that I had never worked for before by like 48 hours where I was then going to get put through OMB and all of the political machinations. So all of these experiences are so different, you know, whether it's labor, whether it's federal government, and I stayed for four years. It was the best learning curve of my life, having that four years in the government, because you really, forever afterwards, it helped me understand the power of what government can do for people if used appropriately. I also had to manage 450 civil servants, and I had the best of them and some of the worst of them. And all that goes in, of course, my VISTA volunteers on my watch decided it was time to unionize. They're a special gift to me because I believed in unions. <laughs> Every VISTA director since got stuck with that. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I've lived a very, the, like, the life of a practitioner and I've lived it in a way that I feel is authentic to my belief system. And I hope, as a result of having done all of these things, I've given some very good advice to the people who I represent. Because these are incredible positions of trust. These are prominent people, whether they're East Coast philanthropists or prominent celebrities, who, to different degrees, different people, have an interest in either taking them down, putting them down, or in um, exploiting them or their reputation. Um, I will deviate for one second when uh, I brought Barbara Streisand to the uh, forum at the Kennedy School to give a speech called The Artist as Citizen, and I'm talking to the dean of the Kennedy School about security, and he said, we have heads of state here all the time. What are you worried about? only to find that people are going through the garbage can trying to find tidbits of information from the paparazzi about Barbara. They were not exactly doing that about the prime minister of a European country. And so even Harvard had to learn what it was like dealing in this celebrity-obsessed world of culture and pop culture where people are just desperate for any bit of information. Um, and the more public they are, the more the ability to know what they're talking about, you can't, it's got to be right. Um, you don't get twice to make the same mistake. Um, recently, Ashton Kutcher was quoted as having talked about how many slaves there still were on the planet in terms of supply chain and, and prostitution and sex trafficking. And he had the numbers wrong. That advisor got fired. You don't get to be that. You don't get to have X number of tweets out there in the millions and get to not know what you're talking about. Um, so I've, I've really sort of had a fairly exper interesting experience of whether it's for politicians, celebrities, community people, laborers, whatever, trying to figure out how theories of change work and how to make the most use of those theories of change. As a result, I'm very um, eclectic. I don't, I don't believe you ever offend with style when you can offend with substance. Um, that is true from like my clothing. When I arrived, in, was, when I arrived from Madison, Wisconsin to Washington, D.C., I had a black beret, wire rim glasses, fry boots, and um, pigtails. And um, all of a sudden, um, working and gray suits, navy suits, black suits, gold earrings, pearls, as I'm testifying in front of Congress. 
Then I get a call to come to Hollywood to be interviewed about a potential new job. And I, oh, I did a major faux pas. I, I don't know how to drive in LA. I lived in DC. You know, it's like a small town. And so I rent a car and I'm trying to find my way to Barbara Streisand's house. And so you ring the buzzer and behind these gates, you know, some voice comes out at you and I say who I am. And the gate opens up and I pull in and behind me comes a tour bus filled with people who are following maps of the stars into the driveway. This is not a good way to make an impression on her. Security comes running out. Those people had to leave. And to the door comes this young woman who was um, a little older than me and she was wearing sweats and had her hair up on top of her head and had no makeup on. And I honestly didn't realize it was Barbara Streisand. I mean, I literally assumed the housekeeper was meeting me and said, what would you like? And I said, can I have a Diet Coke? And you know, that was it. And we went into the den and there's this other woman who's much older sitting there and uh, she's talking to me and she says, oh, I, I write lyrics and we're talking. And by the time I left, I realized between the two of them, they had six Academy Awards, you know? So, but what was more important than the Academy Awards was the fact that the conversation ranged from inner city education, the shipping of uranium on boats across the waters, Chernobyl, climate change. This was 1980 something, 1987. Um, and that this impression that, and I will say this about my colleagues on the East Coast, I think there's a lot of cynicism about um, and arrogance about Hollywood. You know, everybody who writes for The New Yorker or, the, or since Frank Rich left, worked right, left the Times, writes for The New York Magazine. I think they think that people in LA are not that smart, they're shallow, they get paid enormous amounts of money. And what I found was there's a lot of very smart people out there. Most people who work out there get paid very little money. If you look at the membership of the various guilds, you'll find that most of them are unemployed. And a very few people, like in any, like in sports, get paid ridiculous amounts of money. So, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio can get $20 million just to say yes to a movie. But most actors can barely put in enough hours to qualify for their pensions and their health insurance time and all, all of the guild benefits that they need to be able to survive. The other thing I know about Hollywood is it's very creative. People think out of the box. There's no shoulds. You know, Washington was a town of shoulds. The West Coast, as long as you sort of don't hurt anybody else, it's still very Wild West libertarian. You can sort of believe what you believe, be kind to people, and you can, they can believe what they can believe. And everything from, you know, my first experience going to the opera in California when I moved there was, I walk in and everybody's in either jeans and like plaid shirts or it was the time of like Miami Vice so it was like a lot of jeans and t-shirts and sport jackets. And I was used to the Kennedy Center of the Metropolitan Opera in, on the East Coast which is like you got dressed up. It was just so culturally interesting to me to see. I literally did feel like I had landed on another planet for a while. And you know, I'm not exactly the Hollywood type. I don't have blonde hair. I'm not small and skinny and built like that. And I don't exercise 19 hours a day and do yoga. My husband is vegan, but for medical reasons. Um, so it was for me a culture shock, but it was something that I used as a challenge. And I, it was best said to me by a friend of mine who was a director who has since passed away, but he directed an amazing movie called The Candidate. His name is Michael Ritchie. And I was saying to him my West, that my East Coast friends were so cynical about my making the move West. And he said, until they write a screenplay and want me to buy it. And let me just say, I have had members of Congress, the senior rabbi of the state of Israel, the head of state of a Latin American country, either send me tapes of music they had written or screenplays they had written to see if I could help them get made into films or, or records. So it's like, <laughs> it is, welcome to my, that is a little bit, I just wanted you to get a sense of my world because it's very, it's very not, um, not the normal world. 
I'm not. I've never been paid to be one, but, a, but actually a girlfriend of mine, I was at a dinner party and I found out that a piece of information that a studio executive told my girlfriend was not true about what somebody else was being paid and they had lied to her and they said she was making exactly what her co-star was making and I told her she didn't say where she got the information and she ended up making $400,000 a year more that year than she would have made just because of the gossip I picked up at a dinner party. <laughs> That's No, I got a nice trip to a health spa. <laughs> um, but where on the East Coast in the world of philanthropy, there are such strict political lines, which we were all trained by, of C3 work is C3 work. C3 work is about doing, you know, doing service. You can be, you can do advocacy work as a C3, but you can't spend a certain percentage of it, more than a certain percentage of it lobbying. You certainly never think of the sort of connection between 501c3s, 501c4s, contributions to political candidates within the federal or state limits, and now post Citizens United, the whole open season on independent expenditures. But when you're an independent person in Hollywood who's rich, all of those entities are coming at you. They're not going to do that at the Ford Foundation to Darren Walker, the new president. They're not going to do that at Carnegie. They're not going to do that at Pew or at, you know, or, or at Gates because they are run as independent, strong philanthropies with clear missions, but if you're representing either small families or wealthy individuals, all of this incoming is coming at you, and often from people who happen to sit on similar boards. The one thing I can say is I happened in my first earlier life to have been married to a nonprofit and political lawyer who did tax law, and uh, I mean, I really, it was like, that was about the best thing that came out of the marriage was I learned a lot about <laughs> tax law. <laughs> So I never, you know, I mean, that marriage did not last very long, but I was really trained. I mean, he worked for the Council on Foundations. He was the attorney for the Filer Commission on corporate. Tom Asher, do you remember him? So he founded a media access project oh, yeah. with Al Kramer, you know, I mean. So it's like, you don't remember that. Wow. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I, I learned a lot and I said, you know, the first thing you've got to do is when you've, you're responsible for these people's lives, it's such an enormous amount of trust they're putting in you, is separate from just making quality decisions about what investments they make in terms of a social investment situation or a political movement is not getting them in trouble. Because if, if Barbara Streisand spends too much federal money, it's front page in the New York Times. Because um, every year the New York Times loves printing the people who went over their federal max and have to be fined for having done that. Now, unlike where everything is separate on the East Coast and in DC, the people in Hollywood that run this world are, there's this like group of handlers, managers that are your protection, they're your gatekeepers. And everybody has a publicist, a business manager. In other places they call them accountants, but there they call them business managers, a lawyer, an agent, and a, and a creative manager. And all of these people have a lot of input into everything about their creative life, about their, the way they make a living, but these people are clueless about any of the mores or standards of either the nonprofit world or the political world. I just five years ago, my newest client was um, a young director who's now hugely prominent, who asked me to come in and look at their political giving. And the first thing I realized was they had given away $78,000 more than they were allowed to. And I said, we've got to call the DNC and the Senate Campaign Committee and get that money back. He said, I can't ask for the money back. I said, well, you have to ask for the money back. You've broken the law. You, there was nobody in place to say to them, 
you're not allowed to do that. People ask for money, you want to give them a check, then you take the check. And you would rely on the campaigns to vet this. You can't because they don't necessarily, the, the data doesn't come in quick enough in real time till months later. They're getting better, but now there's still at least a six month lag before any of that information is posted online through the FEC or available. So I ended up creating my own little industry out there. I literally, and now there's several people who do what I do. I mean, other people have made this their career choices, um, where we take responsibility for the program decisions, getting involved in figuring out and helping people like any other advisor would, what speaks to them, what is the issue they care about, what, ele I mean, everything from I can spend a year with a client Steven Spielberg, when he made the movie Schindler's List, decided, first of all, it was going to be a huge failure because who, who would want to watch a movie on the Holocaust? Second of all, that he could never live with himself if he profited a dime from this film. So calls me up. I was at the time running a political action committee and working for Barbara at the same time. And he, he says to me, I need advice on how to do this. And, I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, well, I, because the film is about Jewish life, Jewish history, I would like the film, I would like the film's profits, if there are any, and I'm sure nobody's going to come to the opening. I mean, he literally thought, they did a screening two nights before I met with him of just the studio people, the, the Lou Wasserman at that time of the world and the Pubas at Universal thinking, oh, God, is anybody going to... And Stephen actually said, look, I made a billion dollars on E.T. for the studio. They, made, they wanted to do something nice. They let me make this personal passion project. I, could, I finally have the power to do what I want, you know? And so he wanted to make this movie, and they supported it. But certainly they didn't expect to make any money. Stephen has a very interesting philosophy. He makes, a lot of people in, in California don't think this way. They have very strict standards about pay scales based on what their friends are making and what, if you're on different categories of, of, of fame, basically. But Stephen said he wanted percentage of first dollar gross. He would take no salary, so he took no director's salary, no producer's salary, but he essentially co-owned the film. So there was no downside, it was less downside to the studio, it means it may cost way less to make that movie, and that's true of every Spielberg movie ever made since then. He has never, ever gotten a director's fee up front. But the upside is it's not Hollywood mathematics of what they decide is net. It's percentage of first dollar gross on a film. And that is, can be an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and so I said, OK, let's see how the movie does. The movie turns out to be Schindler's List, and it does great. And Steven says, okay, I don't understand why you don't want to come work with me. And I said, because I work with all these women who are in politics and your wife included and it's an election year. And he said, what if I wait? And I said, I can find you somebody great who really knows Jewish life and this is their field. And, and uh, yes, I'm Jewish. Yes, I was raised with Jewish values and it was an important part of my upbringing, but it isn't my, you know, social change, poverty, race, environment, women's rights are more my platform that I really function on. And he said, I really want to make this work. And so he said, I'll wait. So I ended up having the privilege of setting up a foundation for him from the scratch that is not the one everybody thinks about, which documents the Shoah, which was called the Shoah Foundation, which is now in over 60 languages and many, many countries has 57,000 testimonials that have been recorded, is now been placed all at USC, so it's an ongoing archive. And it's amazing. You go in and you say, shtetl cooking, and up can come 300 videos of different people in their testimonials talking about life in the shtetl and, in, in, you know, and, and cooking. You know, separate from any individual story that you can find if you put their name in. Um, so Stephen said, look, I can't be the only funder of this. I am the person who did Close Encounters in ET. 
we need to have other donors. I said, I'm not a fundraiser. I handle the giving of money. I don't do the raising of it for a living. So he put together a staff to run the Shoah Foundation and to really do it. And at first, it was all of his production assistants being trained how to do these interviews by psychologists because it was very you know, hard to go out and interview Holocaust survivors. But he then set up something called the Righteous Persons Foundation, named after the Walk of the Righteous, which were the people who saved Jews during the Second World War. And I said, so what do you want to find? And he said, I just, I know I want it to be Jewish. And so he said, take a year and go out there and look at the best of what's going on. It reminds me of what you said you were asked to do about who's doing what in the South many years ago by another foundation. And I literally, the great part of the job, there's not a person. I don't care who you are, who doesn't, if you say you work for Steven Spielberg, they will meet with you. That president of all the theological seminaries, the best educators, uh, the guy who, I, I, Rabbi Steinsaltz, who translated the Talmud. I mean, I met the greatest minds living in Jewish life. And I also talked about everything from rabbinical training, day schools, the life of a Renaissance Jew today in an assimilated world that's intermarried, I, uh, summer camp and the role that has, uh, why more girls and boys volunteer for social change programs in the Jewish community. Turns out it's not just in the Jewish community. Uh, <laughs> and so I came back and did a mapping of about 16 areas of life and we went through it in a very systematic way. And he said, I'm glad camping speaks to you. I had a horrible experience at camp, off the table. <laughs> I come through, we can do this great camping initiative for $5 million and da, da, da. No. Uh, so the donor still has control. And you've got to always remember, it's, all you can do is give your best advice and know that it's a sacred trust and that it is well done. And if they do it, there's good reason for them to do it. So he not, uh, I mean, he was very interested in sort of uh, social change and young people in, the Jewish li in Jewish life. He was very interested in interfaith, hate crimes, tolerance, diversity. Uh, and so a, a, found a new foundation was born. It's been 19 years and this, it'll be 20 starting in January and it's given away $100 million from a project in, in, in media, culture, diversity, uh, tolerance, interfaith relationships. Uh, originally, there was a large um, section on, uh, we called it Healing the Healers, for peop ways for people who were rabbinical educators and regular educators in the Jewish communal space to have a place to go where they felt they could renew and regenerate, but we're not doing that as much anymore. No, so this is the other thing about California. These people are all still young. They're not like the children of, they're not Mary Mountcastle, whose grandmother, you know, was a Reynolds. They are people who, and who has been raised from birth knowing, you know, it's part of what the family does. and. Those members of the family that are serious about it are going to get taken into the family tradition and whether, it, you know, it, whether you're a Rockefeller or whatever. These are all younger people. They're all in their 50s and 60s. Barbara's now 71, who have made it themselves. And they think that the, they literally still live that they may never work again. This may have been an accident. It, it, they are, uh, it's crazy. They literally will give away money, but they won't give it away where they can't take it back yet. All of them, however, and I've met with, in my case, my clients, all have put it into their estate plans. So I sit there saying, and you can imagine, why not spend it while you can enjoy spending it and see the value of what you're doing? And their attitude is, I'll spend some now, but I just don't know what I'm going to be left with, so I'm not ready to do it. It's a whole new, you know, I mean, I said, you're worth billions of dollars. You're not going to not have the rent money. You know, it's not like they, it, it, it's just a psychological difference. But I do think we're just 20 years away from seeing 
some very large endowments come out of some Hollywood wealth. It's just they, they're not there yet. And in fairness, I think most of the great wealths didn't do it in their lifetime either. It came out of their estates. Um, though there is more and more pressure to give away money than there used to be. It used to be in Hollywood, people gave their time. They didn't give money. And anybody who's been in politics knows you could come and try and get a celebrity to write a check, forget about it. But the value of a celebrity was amazing. They show up in a fundraiser in Peoria or in Ames, Iowa. It's a big deal. And it doesn't have to be an A-list celebrity. It can be somebody from a soap opera. It's still a big deal. Um, people have an unbelievable megaphone, which is where the responsibility lies in terms of these issues. You know, NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council, Bob Redford's been a founding board member. They never have to worry about putting him on the radio, on television, in front of an audience. He knows those subjects. He never speaks on something he doesn't know. And um, we've all seen a lot of people make mistakes. And that's partly because they don't recognize the value of advisors to help them in what they don't know. There's no reason Redford should be a full-time environmentalist. He has had really smart people around him. Well, now he is. He doesn't need those people anymore. But in the beginning, he was intellectually curious, and he put really smart people around himself to help him learn. Um, same with Barbara around reproductive choice. Um, we, we had a situation where Madonna did a Rock the Vote commercial, wrapped, naked, wrapped in the American flag. Turns out Madonna didn't vote. That's just great for Rock the Vote, right? You know, the hypocrisy. So, yes, more people saw that probably voter, voting commercial than just about any other one that was PSA that was on the air. But the backfire, it was sort of, it's sort of the negative backfire because of the hypocrisy of how do you do that? How do you go out into the culture and tell people to do something that you're not willing to do to yourselves? And it's to such an extreme and such a due diligence of, of the press that I remember Barbara just put, Dennis Hayes, who had, was the founder of Earth Day in 1970 with former Senator Gaylord Nelson, um, wrote a book, the thing, Nine Things You Can Do to Save the Earth. So I said to Barbara, can, once we got to the age of websites, I said to Barbara, can we link to this article on the website? And she said, sure. Two weeks later, helicopters flying over her house and an article on the front page of the National Enquirer, she doesn't use clotheslines, she doesn't have photovoltaic solar panels, she's a hypocrite because she's telling people the nine things you can do to help the planet be, you know, be better. So there's a standard that they both pay for and an obligation that goes with it. Um, you can't just... I mean, all, every week I get calls from, whether it's Chris, them all. They all are all of your friends wanting people to go on television because they're celebrities. And I just won't do it unless I know that person. You know, I will put Mary Steenburgen talking about reproductive health and choice on any program. I put her on Face the Nation. She knows it cold. She cares about it deeply. She knows it from its historical point of view, but she also knows it from the psychological and emotional and medical point of view, and her personal feelings are very, very straightforward. She doesn't talk about it in, in a tough way. I mean, she's really good. But I wouldn't necessarily put Whoopi Goldberg on. I mean, you never know what's going to come out of her mouth. You know, John Kerry had her speak in New York at a big fundraiser at, I think it was Carnegie Hall or Radio City. Maybe it was even Madison Square Garden. And it was a big political fundraiser, and she just went off on a rant that was hilarious, but I think the Republicans used that against him for about six or seven weeks of constantly saying what she had said about Bush that backfired. So there's such a, a role of responsibility, the megaphone of celebrity, and the, um, the what's interesting is also the, the, the crazy obsessional interest in it that comes from popular culture and the media. Uh, it's something we all just live with. I would have never understood it if I wasn't, you know, 
immersed in it myself personally. Um, I mean, we have crazy people who just, I mean, I literally had a crazy person show up at my door at my foundation office who said he was married to Barbara, was the father of Jason, and unless I got her, her on the phone, he was going to blow up the building. And he locked himself in the bathroom, and I had to call the police, and sure enough, they put him in on a psychiatric hold. He had recently, he had recently threatened President Bush's 43's life. So you do it, you get crazies who come out of the woodwork that they don't show up at the Pew Foundation or at the uh, Carnegie Corporation or at, you know, somebody who had been in, uh, I guess we were talking about the, you know, the uh, various media people who were funding media. They didn't show up at your office at night to blow you up and stuff like that because Pat wasn't your wife and somebody else, <laughs> you had fathered a child. So it, it's a crazy world and it's an interesting, it's interesting for me to have this perspective talking in a university form because it's, you couldn't make this crap up if you tried. You know, it's too insane. Um, but the megaphone is huge. We've all seen it. You know, George Clooney talks about Darfur. Everybody then knows there's something called Darfur. They're not sure if it's an it or a place. They know that there's something about this word Darfur. I mean, one of my funniest experiences, my first week in Hollywood, something happened where somebody said to me, so where, I had just come back from 10 years, which is where I actually worked with Pat, with Pat uh, on working on Latin America and human rights in Central and Latin America. We had just come back from Nicaragua and El Salvador on a human rights trip. And somebody said, so where is Sandinista? <laughs> uh, where? Uh, uh, the Central Committee of the Nicaraguan government? I'm not sure what you're talking about. I said, you mean Nicaragua. <laughs> so there's that shallow level that people think about. But then there's also people who could have told you literally what every senator's voting position was. And the same weekend, I'm literally being screamed at that Bill Bradley, the only northern senator, is not voting to cut off aid to the Contras by somebody in Hollywood, by an actor on MASH. So it, it's like any other place. There's some really responsible, well-educated people, and there's some really stupid people who don't understand that their celebrity can backfire on the people. Same with politicians. Um, you're running for office, I know. So I'm going to say this to you. Outside money is a blessing and a curse. Sometimes you don't want it. Sometimes you have to take it. But I've been in a situation where I put on the biggest fundraiser for Democratic candidates that had ever happened. Reagan was president. The Hollywood was incensed that, that he was Hollywood. And let me be clear, everybody says that Hollywood's all Democrats. It's not. The two people who achieved real political power, President Reagan, Governor Schwarzenegger, they were not Democrats. So the Democrats don't actually win elections when they get involved in electoral politics. They don't even actually run very much. But the, the Democratic artistic world was crazed that Reagan was defining Hollywood. So they um, put on a big fundraiser, which I helped coordinate. It was called One Voice. And it, the head, and it was head, headlined by Barbara. And it was, the headline was Streisand. It was the same night that Reagan was doing a big fundraiser in LA at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And the headline in the LA Times was Streisand outraises Reagan. You know? And so that's the upside in terms of setting the tone. The downside is two of the candidates that were supposed to receive money from that night said they didn't want to take it because they were afraid it would be used in their home states as you're taking money from celebrities in Hollywood and you know those are not they're like ethically not great people and you know they don't have family values and you know so the person who actually rose to the occasion and really I had a lot of respect for was Tom Daschle and you may remember this hotting but as soon as that fundraiser happened, and w w the way it works is, you know, the, uh, people write individual checks to come to the event, and then they get attributed across each candidate by donation. So if you write a $1,000 check and it's to benefit 10 candidates, $100 from each person gets attributed to each of the candidates in a campaign committee setting. Uh, and so Jane Fonda wrote a $1,000 contribution. 
And so that, that, that $100 was attributed to Tom Daschle and his Republican opponents, this is not recently, this is years ago, went on television with a huge media buy about Hanoi Jane supporting the South Dakota Senate candidate, Tom Daschle. And to his credit, he thought about it. He thought about sending the money back and he said, you know what? If the worst thing they can find out about me is that I took money that was $100 of $1,000 from Jane Fonda, and so he went on the, on the offensive and went on television with his own commercial, essentially showing backroom Republican deals, saying, you know, Jane Fonda is disclosed. Who are they getting money from? You know, he really played it well, and he, and he you know, used it, used it well. And, but several people have returned money. Terry Wood sent a check back to me when she was running in Missouri for governor. Um, she was afraid of the negative press. And Streisand actually made a television movie, produced it about, I don't know if you remember when um, Carolyn McCarthy, who's the congresswoman from New York, her husband was killed on a train, on a subway train in New York. And so Barbara, one of the other things you can do with celebrity other than raise money is you can get things into the culture by making it. She made a, uh, a doc, uh, she made a, a, a narrative television movie about the life of McCarthy. And I was really surprised when Barbara, a, a memo that Barbara had written to Dick Ebhart was leaked. Somehow it got out and it got on CNN. And she got nervous and she wanted to send it a donation back, and I went, how can you do that? You spent three years of your life working with this woman, helping get your story told, and because of one bad press article, you're afraid you're gonna, you're, and, and so she didn't, but it took that level of intervention. Um, I think that when you take an example of the combined power of, I mean, just the ability to get messages out to people, by using popular culture is enormous. So while everybody says celebrities don't give away money a lot, they do make other things hugely possible. The door four examples, one, I know that my husband worked on Earth Day 2000 and um, he happens to be a documentary filmmaker, but what he did was he coordinated the talent for Earth Day 2000 and he got 11 television shows to write Earth Day themes into those TV shows over that week so that environmental messages were, you know, if, if you, it was, there was one in a TV show where he, this guy was a veterinarian and the, the, guy, the, the young woman who was working in his office asked to go to Washington to be let off from her weekend job to be able to go attend Earth Day. Uh, uh, another one was, um, it was Designing Women where one of them got a hybrid car. Um, there is a reason that it works and there's a reason why it doesn't work and the, and the doesn't work is when it's not done well and it's not done with a lot of smarts and people don't know what they're talking about and it's not vetted. If it's done well, I swear to you, Prius hit the, has hit the, the Prius brand hit the West Coast because Toyota was brilliant. They took five of the most prominent young actors and gave them test Priuses for two years before the model was introduced. So every time Leo DiCaprio or Cameron Diaz was anywhere, they were driving environmental hybrids, which became the cool thing to do. And all of a sudden, California is the largest market as soon as it's introduced, and it happens to be a really good car. And you know, if for people who care about their carbon footprint, it's a way of saying to people, you can personally do something, you can buy a hybrid, by using those people. Now, they didn't, they all, they didn't get to keep, they didn't get, were, they weren't given them for free, they got to drive them, you know, they were part of the beta test, it was called. But it was fascinating that corporate America understood that, and they used that. The best example I would say about some of the Hollywood power is, let's use Planned Parenthood as an example. The right wing, I think, on many issues has done this a lot better and the conservative movement has done this a lot better by figuring out we'll fund a think tank and then we'll fund 
the advocacy, and then we'll give some candidates who stand for those principles federal money, and then we'll go in and fund independent expenditures. The place I think we're in the, the two places I think the Democrats have done it best are in the environmental space, but not to great effect because we couldn't even get the bill voted on when it was the uh, Waxman, you know, the Waxman Markey climate change bill. Uh, but Planned Parenthood and NARAL have done it very effectively where they've used celebrities, they've done great, I mean, Planned Parenthood does great service for low-income women as health providers all across the country. They have wonderful celebrity spokespeople. They work very effectively on the Hill in Washington as advocates and uh, organizing vote counts. They have a political staff and a PAC that makes contributions. And then they do independent expenditures on behalf of candidates. And so, you know, in that case, I have a client who's involved in every single one of those things. They have literally gone to Washington to testify for people that they've raised a lot of money for. They have given money to the Planned Parenthood clinics in LA for low-income women. They have given money to the independent expenditure that was managed by Emily's List. And they have certainly supported the recommended candidates. Um, so some of them are very integrated. Some of them are not so integrated. But that's, I think, the example where there is the most integration in a successful way on the progressive side of the table. It's just very different than the, the schooled field of philanthropy that I came out of, I was trained by, and until 25 years ago I practiced. <laughs> but I learned from, you know, I just learned from this experience how smart it is to use different tactics. And I sort of view social change as a medicine kit where you go to the doctor, they have a medicine bag, and sometimes they're going to give you an aspirin, and sometimes an antibiotic, and sometimes an acupuncture, if you have a good integrated medicine doctor, and they do at Duke. And sometimes, um, you know, you're going to need surgery. You, it, there's not one tactic. Sometimes you're going to need a lawyer. You know, for me last year, the most exciting thing that blew my mind is I got to be on the executive team that worked with David Boyce and Ted Olson on the marriage equality trial. And that was such an amazing learning experience. First of all, to see these two people who are such strange bedfellows, but, and who fought like against each other during Bush versus Gore, they are like best friends. They vacation together now. They, they don't agree on anything except this because, and how did it all happen? Somebody in Hollywood, Rob Reiner, got the idea that it would be great if he could find a Republican lawyer. He was very upset that we had had this proposition on the ballot in California. And we, the last minute, the Catholic Church and the Mormons put in something like $60 million against it. And so Prop 8 was defeated at the ballot box, which would have given gays and lesbians the right to marry. And it, it lost by very little. And so it was going to be appealed. So the, the typical movement progressive lawyers who did the original argument were the Lambda Legal Defense, the ACLU. So there were five lawyers led by a transgender attorney who shared a one-hour argument in front of the California Supreme Court against, on the other side, Ken Starr, who spent an hour building the architecture of a, of a brilliant case. Rob went ballistic. And I said, these people are going to go crazy if you start messing around. They're, you know, you, all of a sudden you're entering a field you've never been in before. He said, I don't care. And he was willing to put himself out there and say, I don't care, similar to the way a philanthropist would, like a Bill Gates when he wants to do something, or a Bloomberg who believes something and he doesn't care about the consequences. And he said, somebody told him that Ted Olson really believed this was the last civil rights struggle of this day. And he flew to Washington and met Ted Olson. And Olson said he would do the case, but he said he thought it would be better if he did it with a Democratic co-counsel. And so Rob said, well, who would you like to work with? He said, David Boyce. And that was born. And even though that, you know, two, fast forward two years and the cover of every magazine and strange bedfellows, 
these two men, more than winning a case, which ended up winning because, by going back and just saying the people of California, rather than saying, creating a new constitutional choice that you are free to marry federally as found in the Constitution, it just remanded it back and let the state law prevail. Uh, so f we are free to have gay marriage and marriage equality in, in California. But they changed the narrative in the entire country by creating the issue of strange bedfellows for marriage equality, really, and, and making it so that everybody felt like they knew somebody who should have the same civil rights as they, as they had. Um, and so I got, I mean, now, as somebody who was, my husband did a documentary about, about it was called Unprecedented, and it was about the Bush versus Gore fight. Later it became, there was a TV movie made and, and it won a lot of awards, but I sat with hours of footage in my house, hours watching Ted Olson kill, you know, you know, from his strategy. And I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm going to be working with Ted Olson on something. This is insane. And yet it was so smart. And what was brilliant about him is from the minute we sat down, he said, Everything we do and everything we say for the next period of years until the Supreme Court decides to grant cert is aimed at one person and one person only, and that's Justice Kennedy. And what an experience to see that every, they, from the, they literally cast for, for plaintiffs. They picked people who would speak to a certain voice. They, everything they cited was to, really reach one voice and, and, and they're not stopping. They've just taken up a new case which they're doing out of Virginia which is they're going to hopefully force the court together. to make the decision, yeah together, to make the decision that they were not willing to make on this one. But that's the power of thinking outside the box, not caring. I'm thinking, oh my God, Lambda Legal Defense is going to go nuts. The Gay and Lesbian Caucus is going to go crazy. All these people are going to be pissed off at Rob. And he just said, it's the right thing to do. And you know what? I don't care if they're pissed off. I don't care if I'm a straight actor who, director who people hate. I want this to happen because it's the right thing. So it's been quite an adventure, you know. It's been quite an adventure, you know, from the coal mines of West Virginia to the battlefields of Vietnam to the Carter administration to Hollywood, I've had a lot of different avenues of social change in my life and and I hope, I th and I think that having practiced it, that I can be a mentor to people that were, me like I was mentored, because I totally was, was mentored by people who believed in me, trusted me, and helped me be who I became. And, um, and I really feel like there is no one tactic just like a doctor, you know, sometimes it's organizing, sometimes it's demonstrating, sometimes it's a lawsuit, sometimes it's a research paper, sometimes it's a convening, sometimes it's artists who speak to your soul and your passion and get projects made because they help people in dark times feel better. You know, all of those avenues have been the privilege of my 